Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. In this video I'll talk about reading and specifically about experiments that are discussed in chapter 4 of Grosjean and these the psycholinguistics of bilingualism. All right, let's get to work. So, uh, when you read a word or a sentence on a page, there are several processes that are involved, ranging from relatively low-level processes to uh, high-level processes that involve very abstract kinds of information. So, you see them ordered uh, from low-level to high-level on this slide. So, we start with the recognition of letters or combinations of letters. These are called subsyllabic units because they're units that are smaller than a syllable. Uh, we also have lots of evidence that syllables are an important structural level when people are processing written language. So syllables are sublexical units because they are smaller than an entire word or they may be coextensive with a short word. Um, a lot of today's video will be about word recognition, that is the recognition of lexical units. Um, I already talked about this to a certain extent in the last video. This time we'll see more experiments about word recognition. Uh, word recognition involves what is called lexical access, that is once you've identified a word you retrieve information about that word in the mental lexicon. Semantic information, that is information about the word's meaning, but also grammatical information. Yeah, what word class a word belongs to, how it behaves grammatically, what affixes it take it takes, these kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now reading also involves syntax. That is, uh, parsing is a big part of what goes on when you read sentences on a page. You analyze sequences of words into hierarchical syntactic structures. You identify parts of phrases as the subject, the object, here's the relative clause, things like that. Yeah, uh, And when we get to the most uh, abstract levels of information, uh, when you read, you build up a mental representation of a text. So let's say that you read a narrative text, a text that tells a story, you gradually build up a mental model of the world that the text narrates, yeah, and you integrate new aspects into that model, you monitor what happened so far in the story, and whenever something new happens, you ask yourself, okay, how does this new thing fit into the representation that I already have built up. Right. Um, in this video we'll mostly be talking about uh, word recognition and about parsing. The first part of this video will be about recognizing words, recognizing lexical units, and the second part of this video will be about how bilinguals parse syntactic structures when they read. Okay, here we go. So word recognition in bilinguals, how does that work? Um, in the last videos, I already talked at length about this discussion of language selective or language non-selective language processing. Language selective processing is the idea that as a bilingual you're able to focus on one language and more or less switch off your remaining languages. Uh, non-selective language processing would mean that when you read something and you recognize word uh, syllables and clusters of letters and entire words, that this kind of processing can feed into basically all of the languages that you're capable of speaking. And I can already tell you now that many of the experiments that we'll see here today offer some kind of evidence for non-selective language processing in bilinguals. Right, um, I want to start by commenting on a few useful word types for the study of reading. So there are some word types that we will see appear and reappear in the different experiments. Um, the three types that I want to focus on here are interlexical homographs, interlexical neighbors, and cognates. Interlexical homographs you all know um, by a different name, namely false friends. Yeah? So false friends, interlexical homographs, they are words that are spelled the same across two languages but have different meanings. So in English there's the word location, in French there's the word location, 
and they look the same, but, um, well, malheureusement, they mean different things. Yeah? So location, that's a place where you're at. Location is when you rent something. So let's say you rent some kind of skiing equipment or a car or a flat. Yeah? So, so all of that is uh, location. <clears throat> uh, there's English, the English word coin, and there's the French word coin. Uh, one means a, a little piece of money, change. Uh, the other means corner, different things. Voila. That's it. Um, then there are interlexical neighbors, which are words that share most of their orthographical material, but have different meanings. So in English, there's the word house. There are several words in French that look similar, not quite the same, but words that share aspects of their orthography. There's the English word bus. And again, in French, there are words that look more or less the same but one or two letters are different. You can imagine how this, the existence of these kinds of words may pose some kind of problem or difficulty when bilinguals read a text in a foreign language. Then there are cognates. Cognates are words that share a common history, but may have developed over the course of time meanings that are different even though in most cases they're still related in some uh, tangible way. So for English, uh, for, for instance, English has the word money and French has the word money. Is it a coincidence that there are these two words and they both refer to, well, uh, things having to do with, well, money? Um, so for those of you who don't speak French, money, that is change, yeah? little coins that you have in your pocket and flying around somewhere. So, no, it's not a coincidence. These words go back to the same historical source, but in the present day language, they mean different things. Or take uh, English vest, <clears throat> uh, which is a piece of clothing, uh, basically a jacket with no sleeves. Uh, French vest is a jacket that has its sleeves fully intact. Yeah. No coincidence that both of these refer to upper body garments, uh, even though the actual meanings are slightly different. Okay, those are cognates. We do have cognates where uh, the meaning is more or less equivalent, yeah? but I wanted to focus on cognates that have slightly different meanings here. Okay, so how do these word types allow for the study of bilingual reading? Basically, they're a tool for you to introduce different levels of confusion when you torture bilingual participants with your experiments, as we shall see presently. So let me focus on a few homograph studies first. So false friend studies and what false friends can do to the brains of bilinguals. Here we are. Uh, this is a study by Beauvillain and Granger. By the way, Beauvillain, that's a cool name. Um, anyway, the experiment uh, uses the paradigm of a lexical decision task with priming. Um, I talked about lexical decision tasks in the last video or the one before that. So if you're not sure how this works, go check out uh, that video. Anyway, the question that participants had to ask, answer was, uh, is this a real word, in this case, a real word of English? There was a twist, namely the prime was not in English, but in French. So people saw a fixation cross and then on a screen uh, a word and they were told, okay, first you're going to see a French word, in this case, fleuve, and uh, then they would see a test word in English, and they would have to decide, okay, bicycle, is that a real word of English or not? And of course, bicycle is a real word, so here uh, the participant would have to press yes, that is a word. Right, now the clever thing that Beauvillain and Granger did uh, was that they included interlingual homographs in the primes. So here you see a trial where the French prime is the word coin. Yeah? But of course you can read it as coin, in which case it would be semantically related to money, the English test word. Yeah? <clears throat> so the question is, 
Does Quan prime money even though you're told as a participant that look, you should read this as French, not English? So the question is, can people not perceive it as uh, coin uh, even though they're told, okay, this is Quan? <clears throat> It's kind of uh, relates to the fucking hell example that I started the last video with. Okay, mm. now of course they were there were control trials in which the same word money was tested not with a semantic related prime but rather with an unrelated uh, French word. So, question: Is there a difference in reaction time to? the stimulus money uh, if it's primed by a word such as coin or uh, a word such as chien which doesn't have any semantic relation no matter how you interpret it yeah well maybe dogs cost a lot of money maybe a dog can sniff out money but you know the relation is not as tangible as it is with coin and money okay here are the results, and the results are kind of mixed. Um, and the crucial variable there is stimulus onset asynchrony. I also talked about this in the last video. Stimulus onset asynchrony refers to the time that passes between the prime and the target. Okay, so first we're going to look at a rather short stimulus onset asynchrony, so only 150 milliseconds between prime and target, and here the result is when the target quickly follows the prime, then interlingual homographs prime related meaning. So French coin primes English money, believe it or not. Um, okay, so let's look at the second, the, the, the lower uh, red box here. So on first presentation, when people first see the pair coin and then money, uh, there is a sizable effect of uh, no, some <clears throat> 27 millisecond difference. So in the related condition, the average reaction time is 621 milliseconds. In the unrelated, it's 648. Yeah? And even on later trials where the trial reappears, so to speak, there is still a significant effect. The whole thing changes a little bit when there's a longer pause between prime and target. So if you allow for 700 milliseconds of stimulus onset asynchrony between coin and money, then the effect basically disappears. Yeah? So in that case, interlingual homographs do not prime related meanings, uh, presumably because lexical access has kicked in yeah? and uh, the, the lexical processing of coin takes uh, activity away from any association of coin and money that could spill over to, to some area of your brain. So long stimulus onset asynchrony, in that case French coin, does not lead to quicker reaction times for English money. So what this goes to show is that, again, this business of language selective, language non-selective processing is a very time-sensitive issue. Yeah, so it really matters when something happens if you are to see an effect of non-selective language processing. Um, I hasten to add that the results here are of course compatible with the idea of non-selective processing, but this is not at all surprising because both languages are activated by design in this experiment. Yeah? So we have the French primes that activate French, we have English targets that activate English, so it's fully expected that both languages are active to some extent um, because the experiment essentially puts the participants into bilingual mode. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the so-called homograph effect. In lexical decision tasks, these false friends, the, the interlingual homographs like coin, coin, uh, cave, cave, uh, pain, pain, they yield response times that are different from words that occur in only one language. But this effect can go in either direction. So there can be advantages to uh, reading homographs, namely when the task is to say whether the stimulus is a word in any language that you know. Yeah. However, this can flip 
Uh, namely, there are longer response times, not shorter, uh, when the task is to determine whether the stimulus is a word in one of your languages, yeah, in a specific language. There, it actually becomes confusing that the word is a word not only in one language, but in several languages. Let me show you an example. So uh, the homograph effect would be different across these two conditions. So the language neutral condition would be a question like, is the stimulus a word in any language that you know? And then you see uh, the word here on the left hand side of the screen. And this can be a word in English, cave, it can be a word in French, cave. And so no matter what you think of first, you hit yes. And that's a good answer. Now, Things are a little more complicated when you're given the question, is the stimulus a word in French? So then you see this, and it could be that your first association is, oh, cave, yeah, yeah, that's a but wait, it's a word in English, but it's also a word in French. So by the time you're through these thoughts, subconsciously, uh, a couple of milliseconds will have passed and you have a slower response time. Yeah, that's the homograph effect. It can go either way. And I want to show you a nice little study that uh, demonstrates this. So uh, here we have English-Dutch bilinguals and they were given a language-specific lexical decision task with two conditions. So the Dutch condition, the English condition. The Dutch condition was, is this a real word in Dutch? The English condition, is this a real word in English? And sometimes, rather nastily, there were uh, words that well were homographs. So Dutch has a word glat that means slippery. I nailed that pronunciation glat. Um, and of course there's glad. Yeah. Now the crucial thing is that these two have a frequency asymmetry. So Dutch glat is of relatively low frequency, and English glad is a high frequency word. And if you want to, you can pause the video here and think for yourself a little bit. What do you think this frequency asymmetry does with the brains of bilinguals? So imagine you're an English-Dutch bilingual and you have to answer this question in the Dutch condition. Is this a real word in Dutch? And then you see hot and have to say yes or no. Yeah. Okay. Um, Right, I'll continue uh, showing you a second set of stimuli, which has the inverse uh, frequency profile. So there were also uh, words in the Dutch condition where the Dutch meaning was highly frequent. So the word boom um, means tree, and tree is a highly frequent word. I don't know how many trees there are in the Netherlands, but there, there should be some, at least speakers talk about trees more often than not. Uh, and there's an English word boom, which is not quite as frequent. Yeah, so here we have boom and boom, and uh, speakers had to decide, okay, is this a real word in Dutch or in English? Let's see what came out. So here we have results from the Dutch condition and the English condition, and we do see a homograph effect in that Okay, this is a language-specific lexical decision task. That means we expect slower reactions in the homographs than in the controls. And you see the homographs, those are the uh, dark gray bars and they are a little higher than the control uh, elements from the experiment. But you see that, well, there are certain black bars that are higher than others. And that means that we have an interaction effect between uh, word type, homograph, control, and frequency of meaning. Yeah, that's what is indicated in the labels below. So let's look at the Dutch condition first. So here, um, <coughs> reaction times to words such as glat were higher, meaning that, well, here, this is higher because uh, we have a high frequency competitor from the other language. Yeah? So this is glad messing with the processing of hot. 
So a high frequency element in a different language can interfere or somehow make it difficult to process a low frequency word in the language that you are trying to process. Conversely, here we have the English condition. People were asked, okay, boom, is that a word? And the Dutch word boom, the Dutch meaning boom, interfered with speakers' interpretation, making the reaction times longer. Yeah, so this is an interesting frequency effect that shows, um, well, homographs are especially difficult to process when there's a high frequency competitor from the other language. I find that cool and interesting. I hope you do too. Okay, let's move on to interlexical neighbor studies. Um, so neighbor activation is when you read a word such as hand and your brain also activates uh, its orthographic neighbors. So hand shares a lot of orthographical material with sand, with land, with hard. Yeah, And so these words also get a little bit of activation while you're processing the word hand. Eventually they're suppressed so you have identified hand and you focus on that and try to inhibit everything that looks remotely similar. Yeah, but for a brief moment in time, your brain also activates these neighbors. Okay, and here's another uh, experiment, this time with English-French bilinguals. And this was a lexical decision task where the participants had to uh, language specifically say, okay, is this a real word in English? Yes or no. There were three conditions. Um, so the experimenters gave different names to the uh, words that they presented in the three conditions. The first condition had what they called patriots, so words such as white, uh, which do not have any French counterparts. So there are no words in French that start with WH. Okay, so white is very much identifiable as an English word early on. Then uh, there are words that they call traitors. So a word such as fire has very many French orthographic neighbors. Yeah? So sire, uh, pire, lire, dire, fille. Yeah? All of these share orthographical material with fire. So that would make them potentially more confusing to deal with. And then uh, the third condition were neutral words. That is words such as land which have some French neighbors, but not as many as the traitors. So land has grand, it has l'art, um, but not as many as words such as fire. They controlled for that, they looked for all potential uh, neighbors using uh, a lexicon of French. Okay, so let's see what came out. Um, yeah, expectably, perhaps. Uh, the reaction times were shortest for the, <coughs> uh, for the patriots, slightly longer for the neutral ones, and longest for the traders. Meaning that if you read a word that has potentially very many different targets, <coughs> uh, it takes you longer to verify that, okay, this is the actual word that I'm focusing on. Okay. Moving on to cognate studies. Um, cognates, I explained this, share both aspects of form and aspects of meaning. When we're looking at pairs such as money, monet, uh, raisin, raisin, and vest, and vest, <clears throat> the meanings are related. So uh, I talked about monet and vest. Uh, raisin, that's a grape. Yeah, so the, the, the fresh fruits, uh, whereas English raisin is just the dried thing. Yeah? Uh, but essentially they're talking about the same thing, just in different uh, aggregate states. Here we go. So here's an example of a cognate lexical decision task done with English-Dutch bilinguals. And the task was, uh, is the last word in the sentence that you're about to see a real word in English yes or no. And uh, participants saw sentences such as Lisa came home with a beautiful cat. 
Yeah, and cat is what um, we could call a non-identical cognate. So um, in English, there's cat. In Dutch, there's cat. And they share a lot of their phonological structure. They share a lot of their orthographical material, but they're not completely identical. Uh, there are other cases uh, such as English plan and Dutch plan. They look the same on the page. Yeah? So there you can't really say that there's any difference whatsoever in writing. Okay, um, now what the experiment brought out was that there is an advantage for cognates, as we would expect. Yeah? <clears throat> but this advantage is especially large for cognates that are identical, that do not have any orthographical difference whatsoever. Okay, so this is probably as you would expect, but nonetheless, it's good to know that this cognate advantage is there and that it is especially strong for completely identical, uh, orthographically identical cognates. Now, <clears throat> um, one question that we could ask ourselves is whether visually presented words lead to sound activation, phonological activation, in both languages. Yeah? Um, I don't know what your personal experience is. Um, so early readers activate the sound of words that they read. So they silently read to themselves. Yeah? They, they read with their eyes um, instead of reading with their mouths, yeah? what you do as a school child. And uh, so if you're very experienced, proficient reader, uh, this activation of sound goes down yeah, and disappears completely. And sometimes this may have the undesirable effect that you read a paragraph and you realize, oh my god, I have no idea what I just read. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, when we force people to pay a bit more attention, yeah, let's say focus on individual words, uh, do visually presented words lead to sound activation in both languages and bilinguals? That's something that uh, has been investigated in this experiment by uh, Van Leerdam and colleagues who again focused on English-Dutch bilinguals and gave them what's called a bimodal matching task. So participants saw a word printed on a computer screen or, well, presented on a computer screen, and then uh, simultaneously a sound. And uh, the participants had to answer the question, is the sound a part of the correct pronunciation? So here I've given you an example. Uh, so participants saw this word on the screen, and they would have heard a sound like this to go along with it. Okay, I hope you can hear that. Uh, it's supposed to sound like oud, and oud is part of the con correct pronunciation of mood, and so the correct answer would be yes. Yeah. Uh, so this would be an easy trial. However, as you can anticipate, uh, psycholinguists, they like to do tricky things, um, namely introduce trials that were called catch trials, where we expect lots of errors. So there are words such as mood, which are rather typical English pronunciation given the spelling. Yeah? So English is notorious for being awful with regard to spelling pronunciation correspondence. So we have lots of words such as uh, blood. And it looks orthographically like mood. And you have learners who say blued because you know that's what it looks like but it's not what it actually is pronounced like. So here uh, the participants would see uh, this word, blood, and they would hear ode. something like ode yeah, to go with it. <clears throat> and uh, also with the, the mood, they would hear sometimes sounds like ode. ode yeah. And uh, here the correct answer in both cases would be no. Yeah? Mood has ood and not ode, and blood has ud and not ode. However, uh, Dutch has a lot of words that end in ood, the orthography, and with the sound 
owed, as in road or load. Um, so these were trials where there was potential for the bilinguals to answer incorrectly. <clears throat> um, now, there were also easier trials, so-called no-match trials, uh, with um, sounds that didn't correspond at all to the words that were printed on the screen. So here we have mood together with the sound eyed, eyed yeah, or blood together with the sound eyed. eyed. Again, it's easy to say no, 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 that doesn't have anything to do with each other. So the correct answer, no, should be given rather quickly. Here we have moon eyed. and eyed. Again, uh, people should have an easy time saying, nah, that, that doesn't belong together. Okay, here are the results. Um, and we see that uh, there are white bars for the reaction times of the catch trial, so that would be words like blood, mood, or moon, together with an uh, ode type of um, ode. Uh, pronunciation, so the spelling from Dutch that would introduce the confusability here, and no match trials, those are the shaded ones, I hope you can see that. Uh, so they are a lot shorter and they have no match uh, pairings of sound and spelling, so things like eyed, eyed for uh, words that end in OOD. Okay, so you see that there's this big difference between uh, mood type words and blood type words. Yeah, so mood, that's the the regular spelling in English, blood is the irregular spelling. So what makes this experiment especially difficult is to determine whether this potentially confusing Dutch sound uh, does or does not correspond to an English word that has irregular spelling. Yeah? I think that's a quite interesting result. It's difficult even for the regular, but it's more difficult for the irregular, unpredictable spelling in words such as blood. So, um, the interesting thing about this experiment is that it's conducted in one language only, English, yeah, but nonetheless, the phonology of Dutch seems to drive the results. Yeah? So this ode was in no way identifiable as Dutch, and ex it exists in English words such as road yeah, or load. Um, so when the sound corresponds to Dutch orthography, people make errors with English words. That's really the interesting twist that we see here. And this is evidence for non-selective processes in word recognition. Um, both languages are somehow implicated in the solving of this, this problem, but it's the Dutch that interferes with uh, saying whether or not a word corresponds to a sound in English. So words that are read activate both English and Dutch phonology. That's the take-home message. You cannot help but activate uh, all the sounds of all your languages when you're forced to think about the pronunciation. Yeah? When you read something, yeah, when you read a novel and you read it really quickly, uh, then not all the sounds get activated, let alone all the sounds from all the languages you know. But here, people are forced to think about sounds, and then all of the languages are activated phonologically. Okay, so we've talked about word recognition, the processing of lexical units. Now it's time to talk about uh, syntactic processing, so parsing. How do speakers analyze sequences of words into syntactic structures? How do they identify the grammatical parts of the sentences that they hear? <clears throat> um, again, uh, psycholinguists are very fond of having people process ambiguous uh, sentences, so you've probably heard of garden path sentences, you know, the horse raced past the barn fell, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to talk about things that are not quite as terrible as that, but terrible still. Um, so here's, a, here's an example with a relative clause. That's the colleague of the secretary who works in the dean's office. I would invite you to pause the video here and determine who works in the dean's office. Yeah? Is it the colleague? 
or is it the secretary? Or could it be either? I'm going to continue. Well, a colleague is noun phrase one, the first noun phrase that appears in this relative clause construction. And then, of course, the secretary is noun phrase two. And there are good arguments that you can make for either noun phrase one or noun phrase two when you're saying, okay, who works in the dean's office? Um, the interesting thing is that there are language-specific preferences with regard to this uh, NP attachment to the relative clause. So um, English... Oh, sorry, I need to take this. Uh, wait a second. Okay, sorry, here I am again. Um, right, as I said, Different languages have different preferences with regard to NP attachment. Should the relative clause go with NP1 or with NP2? Uh, now, English has uh, what you could call a proximity preference. Um, so, English has a preference for noun phrase 2, which is directly adjacent to the relative clause. Um, Romance languages such as Spanish and French actually have a preference for a noun phrase one, which is the hierarchically highest noun phrase uh, that we have in the construction. Okay, now <clears throat> here we are. Uh, here's a study on Spanish English bilinguals. Um, I changed the examples to French uh, for the sake of, you know, most of my audience. Uh, and uh, so here are two sentences. <clears throat> French and Spanish both have a preference for NP1 attachment. And uh, both the sentences that you see on this slide are actually unambiguous. That is, there, there's no ambiguity to work out. Yeah? Uh, but nonetheless, we can ask ourselves if one of the sentences is easier to process. So remember that French and Spanish both have this preference for NP1 attachment uh, along the lines of what we see in the first sentence, la police a arrêté la sœur du moniteur qui était blessé. Okay, so the police arrested the sister of the sports coach uh, who was injured. And the, well, uh, the word injured, blessé, here, is marked for gender, namely it's marked as feminine, which leaves only the interpretation that it was the sister who was injured, not the sports coach. Yeah? Uh, compare that to the second sentence, uh, la police a arrêté le frère de la monitrice qui était blessé. So here, blessé, injured, also has the, the, uh, the feminine gender marking, which goes together with monitrice. So here, readers are actually forced to conclude that, okay, this is NP2 attachment, not NP1 attachment. Uh, so blessé, written like this, cannot go together with a masculine referent like the le frère. Yeah? So in short, uh, the, the first variant of the sentence is naturally preferred by speakers of French and at the same time speakers of Spanish if they hear structurally identical uh, sentences and uh, sentences of the second type should be dispreferred. Okay, so how did uh, the researchers investigate whether this actually plays out in ordinary reading and, and ordinary parsing? Um, is there a difference in reading times when you give people sentences like this yeah, and measure how long it takes them to read blessy? Yeah, this uh, feminine marked word, is it more difficult to process that if you force people to do NP2 attachment instead of NP1 attachment? Yeah. <clears throat> so the methodology that was used here was eye tracking. So people read sentences on a screen and their focus with the eyes on the individual words was recorded as they read through a sentence. So <clears throat> uh, the question then is, if you give people a sentence like la police a arrêté la sœur du moniteur qui était blessé, uh, for how many milliseconds do the eyes rest on any given word? Here are the results. Um, for 
the different types of stimuli that were presented. So when we have uh, <clears throat> la police a arrêté la sœur du moniteur qui était blessé. So let's look at the red uh, blessé first. That's the feminine form, meaning that uh, this is NP1 attachment. Um, so here <clears throat> um, we have three different groups, monolinguals, bilinguals with a limited exposure to English and bilinguals with extensive exposure to English. Yeah? So three different types of uh, knowledge of a second language. So no knowledge of English, some knowledge of English and uh, fundamental knowledge of English. So the monolinguals, they uh, are quicker to process the female uh, blessé and it takes them longer to process the, uh, the masculine blessé that goes together with the NP2 attachment. If you force them to do NP2 attachment that leads to longer reaction times as you would expect given the NP1 preference in Romance languages. Um, the same effect is there for bilinguals with limited exposure. Yeah? So they strongly prefer the NP1 attachment over the NP2 attachment. The interesting result of this experiment concerns the, um, the bilinguals with extensive exposure to English. So these are speakers of Spanish that have lived for a long time in an English-speaking environment. And here you see that they're actually somewhat on a par with regard to NP1 attachment and NP2 attachment. So these speakers have experienced a lot of NP2 attachment in the English that they have heard. Yeah. And this has come to infiltrate the way they parse their first language, um, Spanish. Yeah. So that they are actually, when you compare this, uh, actually a little confused by the NP1 attachment. In any event, it's not that NP1 attachment has an advantage. It looks more like a disadvantage. Yeah? But the, the crucial thing is that monolinguals and bilinguals with limited ex exposure show different results than the bilinguals who have lived in an English-speaking environment and are strongly influenced by their second language. There we go. So uh, this means that if exposure to the L2 is strong enough, then parsing strategies from the L2 can influence how sentences in the L1 are parsed. Yeah. So if you live in a different language environment long enough, this can infiltrate your L1. And of course, at the same time, it's evidence for non-selectivity in syntactic parsing. So the syntactic preferences, the syntactic patterns of all of your languages can be activated when you read even just monolingual texts. And with increasing L2 proficiency, L2 speakers will parse syntactic input just like a native speaker. That's actually quite encouraging. Yeah? So maybe your pronunciation will always give away little traces of your L1. But when it comes to syntactic processing, you can actually be indistinguishable from a native speaker. And that's cool. Right, uh, last part, short part of this video concerns processing uh, syntactic and semantic anomalies, uh, such as, you know, odd sentences like the house has 10 cities in total. Um, syntactically, this is fine, yeah, like uh, Chomsky's um, <clears throat> colorless green ideas uh, sleep furiously, but semantically, it's odd. So houses don't have cities. It's just semantically very weird, even though houses and cities have something in common. Um, well, this is just confusing. Um, note that this is different from the oddity that we see in a sentence such as turtles move slowly, which is semantically fine. Turtles are slow animals, but formally this is odd. So the, the, the verb is marked up in a way that doesn't agree with the subject that we see. So it would require move and not moves. A question that we can ask ourselves is, do L1 speakers and L2 speakers react to these anomalies in the same way? And do reactions change with increased proficiency of the L2 in bilinguals? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, standard measures that are uh, 
common currency in neurolinguistics. One is called the N400, which is a negative peak um, in ERP studies that you get after reading something that's semantically odd. Yeah. So here we see a graph. Uh, the N400 is this thing that is marked up here. So this is uh, negative. <clears throat> and uh, it corresponds to sentence two. The pizza is too hot to sing. Yeah. So uh, when you hear the word sing after the pizza is too hot, that semantically doesn't make any sense. And so you get this negative peak showing that, okay, something is very wrong and odd um, 400 milliseconds after you processed the word sing. Uh, the, the pizza is too hot to eat. There you see this uh, peak is actually absent here. Business as usual. This is uh, information that I can process. Okay, N400, keep that in mind. Uh, there's also a second measure that's called the P600. So N stands for negative, P stands for positive. So something positive that goes on 600 milliseconds after a morphosyntactically odd stimulus. <clears throat> um, so if you give people sentences like the cat won't eat, that is business as usual, that is a normal grammatically correct English sentence, the cat won't eating, yeah, semantically it's okay, grammatically it's weird, and that gives you uh, this kind of uh, positive charge 600 milliseconds after the crucial offending word eating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, there have been studies that tested responses of bilinguals to uh, syntactically and semantically odd sentences. So when you give people sentences like the house has 10 cities in total, um, both monolinguals and bilinguals actually show the N400. But when you do this with late bilinguals, the N400 comes a little later. So that means that semantic integration works faster in your native language, as perhaps you could expect. <clears throat> now, when it comes to syntactic anomalies, um, there were earlier findings that native monolinguals react with the P600 to sentences such as turtles moves slowly, but L2 learners do not show that result. Now, uh, Ojima and colleagues have studied English-French bilinguals and they actually managed to show that L2 learners develop this behavior, the, the P600, with increased proficiency. And this is kind of relates to the earlier findings of syntactic parsing and looks towards uh, the NP1 and NP2 and the uh, adjective that describes them. So as you become better in the L2, your syntactic processing becomes more native-like. It's sort of a gradual journey towards nativeness. Okay, summing up, um, the processes that we talked about in this video are uh, chiefly word recognition and then some aspects of bilingual parsing. <clears throat> um, with regard to lexical access, uh, we've seen that interlexical homographs, false friends like uh, location, location, are an important type uh, of words that can be used to study how selective or non-selective language processing works in bilinguals. And we saw homograph effects, that is faster reactions in language unspecific lexical decision tasks and slower reaction times in language specific lexical decision tasks. We also saw that the role of frequency is quite important so that a high frequency competitor from a different language can really make it difficult to, um, uh, to, to carry out a language specific lexical decision task. Okay, uh, with regard to interlexical neighbors, we've seen that um, there's a difference between patriots and traitors. So traitors, words that have many orthographic neighbors in the other language, these lead to lower reaction times in lexical decision tasks. And with regard to cognates, we've seen that cognates are easy to recognize and elicit fast reaction times, especially when they look exactly the same orthographically across two languages. <clears throat> with regard to sentence processing, we've seen that if exposure to the L2 is strong enough, 
for example, when people have lived in a different language environment for a long time, then parsing strategies from the L2 can influence how sentences in the L1 are parsed. And uh, with increasing L2 proficiency, L2 speakers will parse syntactic input just like any old native speaker. Um, semantic integration, however, seems to be more difficult and hence is slower in L2 speakers. All right, that's it for today. Uh, in the next video, we'll focus on uh, writing in bilinguals. And until then, au revoir. See you then.